It's the first time since I retired and anybody listened to me. <laughs> well, we, had, uh, we appreciate uh, the panel and uh, quite a few people getting here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Most of these things start a little bit later. Dave Mills is awake. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Gil Decker, who was uh, is a good friend and was our Assistant Secretary of the Army for acquisition. Did we have logistics back with it at that time? Did I allow that to happen? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> it was acquisition and technology, but he is, uh, he is on a study that is looking at the acquisition system uh, from A to Z. So if you have any thoughts on it, I know Gil and that members of his panel would be uh, gl uh, glad to hear from you. We have uh, some wonderful people here today. Uh, I, I, uh, General O'Connor was just giving me feedback on my son, who we bumped into in, uh, in Iraq. And you didn't give him a coin, but that's OK. And then we have uh, Bill Phillips, who's our uh, mill dep a long time, Jim Pillsbury. Uh, if you don't know Jim Pillsbury, you have never been to these things before, and Mitch Stevenson, who I am the Colonel Emeritus of the Ordnance Corps, and Mitch is the Senior Ordnance General on active duty. You still have that? That means you're getting old. <laughs> well, listen, uh, we've, you've got a good panel here this morning, and they're going to go through. And I think uh, that uh, I've heard a lot of these pitches before at other symposia, and there is some good stuff in here. Uh, and there's the challenges are just beginning as we bring all this stuff back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mitch? Thanks, sir. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, I was going to introduce the, the crowd here, but you, uh, John Solomon's already done that. It's good to see all of the friends out in the room. I think I recognize about 75% of you out, out there in the room. Um, and it's also good to, to know who are the guys that survived last night's festivities <laughs> and were able to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning to come listen to a logistics panel. Uh, there's one. <laughs> um, We've got uh, two hours this morning, and, and uh, that'll be largely up to you all. Uh, each of us are going to spend about 20 minutes uh, talking about a different subject related to logistics. I'll kind of give an overview from where I sit at Department of Army. Jim uh, Pillsbury will talk about the great things that AMC is doing uh, in, on a number of fronts. Uh, next to uh, him, of course, is uh, General Bill Phillips, who will talk about the uh, work that's going on in reforming the acquisition workforce and some other acquisition-related topics to us uh, guys in the logistics business. And of course, on the far end there, last but certainly not least, is Jack O'Connor, who is uh, just back from, uh, from Arif John in Kuwait. <coughs> and, and tonight, we'll head back to Arif John in Kuwait uh, to finish out his tour there, and hopefully in another month or so, uh, be able to come back here and come to work for me. I've been waiting on him for about a year. Cool. <coughs> and he, he can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jack will be replaced by Jesse Cross, who uh, will change command at the Quartermaster School in <coughs> 22 November, I think it is, uh, take a little bit of leave, and then report for duty uh, there in Arif John. And, and uh, Jack will tell you all about what's going on in Southwest Asia. It is the focus of all the logistics effort that we've got going, certainly mine. I know uh, General Pillsbury's and, and uh, General Phillips as well. A lot happening over there, and I won't try to uh, steal Jack's thunder and let you uh, hear from him. Uh, exactly how complex that operation is. So as I said, about 20 minutes each, that will leave, if you do your math, there's only four of us up here today, uh, that will leave about 40 minutes for discussion. Uh, and, and so we've got plenty of time for discussion. I encourage you to think about things that you might want to bring up in this forum. This is, as General Sullivan said, a professional logistics forum. And so we ought to make it that. We ought to make it into a discussion, and you ought to ask the hard questions and see uh, how well we do in trying to answer them. And maybe there will be some answers out in the audience as well, because we guys, us guys up here don't have all of, the, all of the answers, that's for sure. So I've got a number of things. I got what General Coburn, my uh, former boss, used to call a drive-by. It, it was more slides than you can possibly do in 20 minutes, so I'm going to drive by them. And, uh, and then, uh, again, just to sort of whet your appetite, food for thought, maybe stimulate a question for discussion later on, and we'll move on. So go ahead to the next chart. Actually, the next two charts, and the one after that. You heard General uh, Casey yesterday talk about the strategic environment. I won't repeat that. He talked about this in the address yesterday at lunch. 
uh, which it was his effort, his, his time, his four years as the chief, uh, he devoted to getting the Army back into balance. And as you heard, by the end of next year, we think we'll be pretty close. It won't be completely done. There'll still be units uh, that are back less than two years before they deploy again. I'm talking about active units. And some reserve units that are back less than four years before they go again. Um, but nonetheless, um, we're getting close. And a lot of good things are happening from that. And some, some interesting things are happening from that, uh, which I'll talk about as we proceed through this. But I'm not going to spend any more time on this because I know you're familiar with the subject. Unless there's a question, and, and again, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Next chart. I do want to talk a little bit about R4Gen because there are some things that are happening in the R4Gen area that, that warrant consideration by professional logisticians. And what you see on this chart on the left is, of course, the way we used to generate forces to deploy. Uh, we had, you know, our, our uh, sort of the below-the-line force uh, that we always had ready, and then we had a strategic force over here. And you can see the only reserve forces were back here because we didn't need them until later on in the fight. And usually that was the big fight. Uh, but now in R4Gen, you can see the three phases of R4Gen. The first phase, or depending on how you look at it, the last phase, uh, reset, the train ready phase and then the available phase, you can see there are little yellow boxes throughout uh, that circle. And so the message there is that reserve component forces are required throughout the R4 Gen cycle and need to be incorporated uh, into how we operate as an army. That is a major paradigm shift for us. Uh, and you really need to give it some thought. And, and I'll talk more about Haiti a little bit later on and you'll see, get an example of what I'm talking about. We don't have this figured out yet. We don't have the legislative authority we need yet for this to happen. But if it doesn't happen, then we've got some major restructuring we've got to do because we don't have enough active logistics forces to pull this off. You heard the chief talk in terms of 1, 5, 20, 90. The 90 being the enabling forces that go along with the BCTs and the division headquarters. Well, Two-thirds of that 90 is reserve component. So if you intend to deploy a force somewhere, and support it with CS and CSS forces, you better have access to the reserve component. So that's the message uh, there on that chart. And again, I'm not going to spend any more time, but happy to answer questions about R4Gen. I've got another R4Gen <laughs> chart coming up next. And then uh, the, the, a message, a couple of messages here that I'd like to point out to you. You see two terms there that you need to get familiar with. You guys in uniform uh, know what those terms are. But for those who are not in uniform, the top line is the DEF, the Deployed Expeditionary Force. This is the force, the, 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 the piece of the Army that has been assigned a mission. They know where they're going and can therefore train up to get there. The bottom part is the contingency expeditionary force, the force that has not yet been assigned a mission. Now, up until now, we haven't had a problem because everything was up here. There was nothing down here. But starting next year in fiscal 12, given the drawdown that's going on in Iraq and given the predictions that we have about the demands on the force, we're going to have units that go in through the entire R4Gen cycle and then don't deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan. They'll be, maybe participate in some partnership exercises, uh, nation building. Uh, the COCOMs will probably want them to participate in a number of exercises in their area, but it won't be a combat deployment. And so what does that mean for things like reset? I'd be happy to talk about that when we get there. Uh, two other points on the slide that I want to make mention of. The first is the surge force. Uh, this is uh, something that's sort of evolved as we thought about R4Gen, because as you can see from thinking about R4Gen, this is a supply-based strategy. It means that we can have one, div one core, five division, 20 BCTs, and 90,000 forces of enablers in order to keep to a one to two dwell for the active and one to four for the reserve component. If you try to do more than those numbers, more than 1, 5, 20, 90, um, then you need more forces. Or you shorten the dwell. And we don't want to shorten the dwell. We're probably not going to get more forces. And so this is a supply-based strategy. What that means to us then is what if something bad happens while we've got 1, 5, 20, 90 deployed? Where are we going to get something else to react to it? And the answer is we're going to reach back into train ready and pull forward forces that are not completely through their train ready uh, cycle, but are close. And that's the thinking there behind the sur surge force, and I'll be happy to talk about that later. Last uh, topic that I'll mention here is this notion of aim points. Uh, we've been given two aim points, 
The first at the end of the reset phase, this is an active chart, by the way. There's a companion chart for the reserve component. It just has five years rather than just the three here. Um, first aim point for the active component is at the end of the reset period. That's 180 days after they get back from work from or after they uh, come out of their available phase. Uh, and we've set stand, uh, goals for ourselves in terms of how ready we want to be in terms of people, training, equipment, and, and the readiness of the equipment on hand. And then likewise, there's another aim point six months later, a year or, uh, after they've come out of the available phase, and there are different standards set for that. For us in the log business, our aim point here is that we want them to be at R2. Think in terms of the USR reporting criteria that you've known and grown up with, you military folks in the room. R2 means not fully 100% ready, but pretty close, for those that are not familiar with it. R2, pretty good. We, we'll go to war with an R2 unit. Uh, and then R1, fully ready, 90% of the forces fully ready uh, by six months into it. And, and again, for the reserve component, the timeline's a little bit different. In terms of equipment on hand, a little bit more challenging. In the interim, we're going to start with a goal of S3 here, S2 here, and of course S1 by the time they deploy. Uh, we still got some equipment on hand issues in the Army, and again, I'd be happy to talk about that later on. Next chart. Last chart on R4Gen, and this is really the point that I made earlier. Um, you can see here in, in um, the, the period in uh, 09 to 10, uh, we had a demand of more BCTs. There's more than 20 there. It's 26 and more than 90,000 worth of enablers. Uh, we didn't have a, large, a larger force to accommodate that, so what did that mean? It meant shorter dwell periods. And you heard the chief talk yesterday about the fact that the, the, the best thing that can happen to the United States Army is to get to at least two years of dwell uh, for the active component and four for the reserve component. As we move into fiscal 11, the fiscal 11 rotation, notice that we drop down to below the 20 that we say we can make available in our supply-based force. That's a good thing. That means BCTs are going to get there two years between deployments. But the, the enablers are still problematic. We're still 15,000 more than what we should be able to produce, uh, given one to two and one to four. Notice next year what happens. We get into balance. We see a demand for 20, and we see or we have an, avail an, an ability to produce 20. We don't see a demand for 20. And we have an ability to produce 90, and we don't see an, a, a demand for 90 either. And so next year is a banner year for us, and it gets us to that balance point we're talking about. And then way out here in fiscal 15, we have visions of further reducing our deployment time and increasing our dwell time, and maybe even going to nine, nine months deployed, uh, 27 months back. But that's work to be done. We did program in into our POM this year, uh, but a little bit too far into the future to get too, uh, too certain of what, what's going to happen. Next. Next. I get asked all the time, what's going to happen with reset? And so we built this chart, sort of generic, doesn't have a lot of details in it because I can't give you a lot of details about the 12 budget. Uh, but, but you can see that, that our 11 budget is, um, is pretty healthy. Um, we don't have a budget yet, but, but the, we, we do know uh, what the Congress has been doing with our budget, and we're pretty comfortable that it's going to turn out okay for us. Uh, in 12, you can see the numbers drop. Uh, and in 13, we've got some question marks. And that's just natural. We're not, you know, we're not uh, too excited about that. Notice these two lines here. This first is the blue line. That's the demand for a reset for Iraq-based forces. Naturally, it's coming down and will end, given the president said we're going to be out of Iraq by December of next year. And the green line is the demand for reset for Afghanistan-based forces. Notice it went up to a line and plateaued because we're at the end strength that we, we need to be. 100,000 total forces in Afghanistan. What's going to happen with that? Well, we heard, we've heard the president say we're going to start to reduce that amount next summer. We don't know exactly what that means, and so we've just sort of drawn the line out there and made some, put some question marks on the chart for uncertainty. But what we do know is that we will re continue to require a reset uh, for our forces that are deployed in Southwest Asia, and we're going to need that reset and those reset dollars for two to three years uh, past the end of hostilities, and that hasn't changed. Next. Um, and then, uh, likewise, a sort of a p companion thought to reset, because reset isn't all about depot maintenance, although lately it has turned into a lot about depot maintenance, uh, but some other thoughts about depot maintenance, and the thing I want you to get 
mostly out of this chart, is that starting in our 12 budget, assuming that it gets approved by OSD and OMB and, and the President sends it to the Hill as we've constructed it, uh, a lot of our OCO-based depot maintenance uh, funding is going to move into the base and will ensure that we at least cover our core requirements in the base budget. We've had a little help. Uh, there's, a, there's something called a, uh, an RMD, a resource management decision, number 700, that was issued last year by OSD that requires the Department of the Army and all of the other services to fund, uh, to, to move our depot maintenance requirements into the base and then to fence them so that we don't use them as bill payers for other things. That's a good thing uh, for me in the G4 because it, it, it helps protect me uh, from well-meaning people in other parts of the building who have what they think are higher priorities than we do for depot maintenance. And I'd be happy to talk about that uh, if you want to. Next. Go ahead. Um, you heard the chief talk about full spectrum operations. Um, and, and that's a very important thought because what we have been doing for the last nine years is essentially uh, counterinsurgency operations. Uh, I was just out at the NTC last week. They're preparing for their first full up, force on force, full spectrum rotation. They're actually going to do a little rehearsal with the 11th ACR uh, the regiment, uh, pieces of the regiment against each other, uh, squadron against squadron preparing for a full spectrum rotation because we've forgotten how to do it. And the full spectrum tank on tank operations will occur next summer out at the NTC. The rotation that the chief described yesterday in his talk uh, that, that was, is going on now at the, at the JRTC is a light infantry force on force full spectrum uh, operation. It, it is, it is uh, underway with actual uh, forces who are, are going to have enough time We've sort of said to ourselves, if they're going to be in dwell longer than 15 months, we're going to require that they uh, train in full spectrum op. And that's all I'll say about that. Next. I, I promised to mention Haiti. Uh, we did that, as you know, in January. Uh, logisticians did a very good job here. Terrific support from the joint community. We would not have pulled this off had it not been for U.S. Transcom and the Department of the Navy. Our great partners with us as we, as we did this. But next chart. Um, in the AAR that we had, what we learned was uh, that we had gotten rusty at some of our skills. As an example, when you deploy today uh, to Iraq or Afghanistan, you know you're going to deploy over a year ahead of time. The whole institution is helping push you out the door. We've been doing this for nine years. We know how to deploy forces. ITOs on the installations have got this down to a science. But then you take this force that is into this routine, you know, lockstep deployment mode, and you say, go now to Haiti, not to South, go to Haiti. And all of a sudden it's, oh, damn, I haven't got my TC Ames up to date. Uh, my UDLs are not complete. Uh, I don't have this equipment logged in. We had a forward support, a brigade support battalion deploy without their ASL. I mean, that, to me, I don't know how you do that. Deploy without your, de left without their SARS box. Because, you know, when we go to Southwest Asia, we fall in on an ASL, and we fall in on a SARS box. And so those aren't important things to think about. You see what I'm talking about? We have forgotten some of our basics. And so we've got to get back to that. And the other big lesson we learned there was that the uh, 377th TSC, our reserve component TSC, which supports U.S. Southcom and our South, uh, needs to be able to react immediately. And, and we got caught up in waiting on a deployment order. They're a reserve component uh, headquarters. We had to wait 30 days to get them into the fight, and, in, and the only way we could do that was take an active component, ESC, ESC, that it wasn't even done with reset yet, throw them into it. They, they didn't even have a support operations officer in their headquarters. That's how unprepared they were. It wasn't their fault. They had just come back from Iraq. We, we've got to sort our way through that. Some good work's been done already in the 377th with their AC uh, con, uh, counter... Uh, contingent in their headquarters, as well as the AGRs. They've organized themselves into early entry modules and an early entry command post. And next time, it will be a lot better because they'll have forces they don't have to wait for a deployment order for. But lots more work to be done on the whole reserve component thing. And I, go ahead, I'm about out of time here. Um, skip that. Let's see if there's anything else I want to hit. I'm going to save the, uh, the buildup in Iraq and Afghanistan 
uh, the buildup in Afghanistan, the drawdown in Iraq for, for Jack. Uh, he'll have plenty to say on that, I'm sure, so I'll skip that. Next, go ahead. Next. A lot of airdrop going on in, uh, in Afghanistan. This is a high point for us in airdrop since probably, I don't know, I think we're doing more airdrop than we did at Quezon uh, and in a whole period in Vietnam. Next. Next. Keep going. Keep hitting them. Uh, I can talk about equipment that's coming out of Iraq. Um, in the question and answer period, I'm not going to talk about it now. Go ahead. And a lot about MRAP. I'd be happy to talk about, uh, you know, all the challenges. Actually, we're doing pretty good. MRAP readiness is not bad considering what we did here. I mean, this is... The fielding of MRAP is exactly how you don't want to do it uh, to make something logistically supportable. Um, but it's going okay. And the log logisticians out there are doing a great job. Getting a lot of help from contractor support, for sure. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't be doing okay. Uh, and AMC is doing a great job as well. Ne go ahead. And let me go ahead, keep going. I can talk about APS if you want to. Good news in APS. Uh, for the first time since 2002, we have a brigade combat team afloat and ready to respond to worldwide contingency. It's been a long time coming. And by 2015, uh, we'll have the full up uh, um, strategy that we've been working on ready to go. Um, so very important milestone that just occurred over the last 30 days. Next, next chart. Go ahead. I can talk about uh, GCSS Army, good things happening there. Uh, we're live across the board in not only the SSA, but su property book, uh, unit supply, maintenance operations and financial management and embedded financial management capability out at the NPC. Uh, keep, keep going. Good work being done in LOGSA. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave, leave that for question and answers. And am I about at the end of this thing? Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> IUID, good stuff there. Lots of work going on in efficiencies. You've heard the, the uh, number of speakers talk about efficiencies. This is a big topic in the Pentagon these days, as it should be. Secretary of Defense is giving us our marching orders. And as you would expect, there are efficiencies to be had in the logistics area. And there will be log efficiencies had in the logistics area. This is a flavor of the things that we're working on. I'd be happy to talk about those in Q&A next. Uh, I could talk about some stuff LIA is working on as well next. Keep going. And I think I'm done. All right, so uh, I know a lot. Uh, my intent was not to uh, cover these topics in detail but to whet your appetite for the Q&A, and I'd like to now turn over the floor to my partner, Jim Pillsbury. Jim. Thank you, Mitch. It's great. Uh, thank you for uh, getting up early. I, I see two friends of mine. That's all I got, <laughs> both aviation maintenance guys. And you heard about the aviator and the ordnance officer who are driving on a dark country road. And he crashed head on, totaled their cars. Both ejected from the car, both knocked out, both woke up at the same time. One looked at the other and says, you're an aviator, you're an ordnance officer. We ought not to fight anymore. This is a sign from God that we ought to work together. We ought to have one branch fixing all things. I agree, I agree, and to, and to, and to solidify thing, let's see if there's another miracle and the aviator reaches into the trunk of his car and pulls out a fifth of Jack Daniels, said, let's celebrate our newfound friendship, our newfound partnership. He hands the fifth of vodka or a bourbon to the ordinance officer. The ordinance officer drinks half of it, hands it back to the aviator and says, no, I think I'll wait until the police come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, I don't have as many slides, so I'm going to spend a little more time on mine um, talking about what AMC is doing. I'm also going to get off them a little bit because uh, Mitch mentioned uh, um, GCSS Army, uh, and, and on, on the slide was LMP also, uh, Logistics Modernization Program, the largest ERP that's been fielded, uh, certainly will, will be part of the sale uh, when GCSS Army comes on board and GFIDS, and, and whatever the personnel one is going to be called um, uh, sometime in the future. However, we just went live at D3 at uh, ASC, uh, uh, TACOM, and Joint Munitions Command. And, and the sun came up the next day. Uh, we all thought it, would, it wouldn't, but it did. So great work done by, by uh, both uh, uh, the PM and the field. Next slide, please. That's my agenda, and no one ever remembers an agenda slide. Next. Um, Mitch mentioned strong equipment readiness in the MRAP. 
Somebody raise a hand if they've got a problem in another weapon system that's deployed. And, and that's, that is saying a lot. Yes, based on the congressional plus-ups in OCO, uh, we've been able to make sure that our SSAs stay full. Uh, because we had some wonderful contractors over there turning wrenches in, in support of us, uh, we've been able to maintain in incredible um, readiness rates. Every Tuesday, uh, AMC goes around the world and, and to include the LCMCs, and the LCMCs brief us on their weapon systems readiness in theater. And yes, there are challenges within units, and yes, there are challenges within particular weapon systems, particularly low-density ones. But by and large, our major combat systems have been in the green for these nine years. And that is a remarkable, remarkable um, ac accomplishment. We mentioned uh, AMC support to the, to the build-up and surge. Uh, that is to SDDC, and that is to Jack O'Connor and the team of, of uh, his, his crew in AMC SWA. Uh, Jack is dual-headed as CG, AMC SWA, and G4 for Arsene. Uh, as, as, as a result, he is a nexus for the support that goes on be in theater and in between Iraq and Afghanistan. Tremendous effort by SDDC ongoing. Is SDDC represented here? No, they're not, but I, I see one transporter out there. Hi, Sue. Enhanced property accountability. Uh, one thing that Mitch mentioned that maybe we got a little rusty on is force on force full spectrum operations training. One thing we got rusty on uh, about midway through this conflict is property accountability. And through some great efforts by uh, ASC, in particular Sergeant Major Blake out there, um, we have recovered, we, ASC has recovered, I don't know, what, what's the total figure now? He's about 300 million? Yeah, about 300 million dollars of stuff that had been written off in old reports of survey. I, I still don't know what FLIPPLE stands for, but the old report of survey. And by getting property in back into our hands and brought to record in PBOOS, they've been able to find serial numbers that have been written off to the tune of about $300 million. So I said about halfway through, since about 2008, maybe late 2007, uh, and with the G4's help, we've been able to, to really we, the Army, has been able to really help out in the property accountability business. And, and that's, a, that's a skill that we're going to have to bring back to uh, our Army. The Chief mentioned something the other day. Uh, he said that we're going to have to get back into a garrison leadership role. We have been out of that because we've been deployed so much. Part of garrison leadership is property accountability and getting the culture back ingrained in our soldiers. Um, Pursuit Equipment Modernization, MRAP, NSE, Non-Standard Equipment. There are, I don't know, 44, 46 billion dollars worth of uh, non-standard equipment we bought based on ONS and JUON. Uh, and, and each one helps, each one is protecting soldiers, each one is benefiting our soldiers. And, and that, that's, that's a lesson learned in our acquisition uh, um, system of rapid support to soldiers. And I think the acquisition community uh, and the logistics community ought to applaud themselves for accepting the challenge and taking it on. Okay, next slide. Next slide. OEF and OND, New Dawn and OEF. Look, this box here and this box here is RSENT support element Iraq, RSENT support element Afghanistan. Is that right? Good. We got them right. And then this, this thing down here is R2TF, uh, Responsible Reset Task Force. You all have heard about that. General Dunwoody established a, uh, a cell over there in, in Kuwait. Jack Dugan, who, who most some of you know, is an SES, retired, has come back on active duty, running the force. Gary Bunch, where are you? Gary, raise your hand. Gary's going to go over and take over for Jack uh, late uh, November uh, and carry, carry this thing forward for the next six or eight months. And then it's brought back to the material enterprise as this equipment is identified for retrograde in either country, it is uh, sent through a vetting process that says, do I need it in Iraq? 
Do I need it in CENTCOM? Do I need it in, in, in any area that our CENT wants it? If it is, that equipment is then transferred to that particular organization. If not, it is given to the R2TF to make sure it gets back to the proper disposition, either throw away, uh, DLA, is DLA here? Anybody DLA reps? Um, they, they've got a new naming convention in DLA. It's a uh, land component, right? Maritime. Land and maritime, uh, and then um, aviation, and then they changed DRIMS to something. I have no clue what it is. It, it, it will always be DRIMS as long as I'm in the Army. <laughs> Some things just well, can't change. And I told Admiral Thompson that. Uh, but uh, we either destroy, uh, d uh, put, put it into uh, Dermo or we take it to Sierra for storage or we send it to a source of repair uh, and then the material enterprise takes it from there. Next. And next. Next. Okay. This is uh, a lot of money. And in the disposition services organizations over there, I think you have four in uh, Iraq, uh, one large one in Kuwait, uh, and establishing a couple in uh, Afghanistan now. Um, there's some great partnerships between our LCMCs. Uh, TACOM, commanded by Kurt Stein down here, CECOM is uh, represented. That they have, uh, by Frank Zardecki here, they have a, uh, a tremendous um, presence over there, as does AMCOM. Uh, I don't see any AMCOM folks here. <laughs> I'm going to wear them out. All right. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk about JMC in just a second. But the folks that really are doing some heavy lifting here for us are our LARs that go into the Dermo and identify disposition services uh, and go in and identify that stuff that shouldn't have been thrown away. And, and I got to tell you, um, for, for the, all of us that have been in theater, that is some hard work in some pretty nasty conditions. Um, the, let me get here, AMCOM LCMC, they found a uh, Black Hawk tail rotor assembly, brand new, a uh, Black Hawk drive shaft assembly, brand new, and an Apache actuator bracket assembly, brand new, and that, that's part of that $11 million that uh, has been saved uh, from being tossed away. Now, that goes back to a little bit of the property accountability uh, culture also. Uh, CECOM, a lot of money, and it's a, and it's a lot of items. Uh, you don't see a lot of high dollar value items uh, relative to aviation and, and truth be known to ground, but you find a lot of items that have been thrown away that shouldn't have been. And that's why I'm, I, I'm singling out CECOM for their great work too. TACOM doing just a marvelous job. Uh, I happen to find five brand new trailers uh, that had brand new. Uh, 2009 manufactured uh, that were in the disposition services yard in, in, uh, in uh, Arif John. Uh, called Kurt, 